Game on. Good morning, Sec App Dev students and professionals. We're going to talk about uh, application layer authentication, and uh, it's academically called entity authentication. So Bart yesterday talked about the similar topic in the in the context of more pure crypto, in terms of establishing a public-private key relationship and how to set up secure communication with another party. This is a different topic. That's formal entity authentication in the world of crypto and uh, asymmetric crypto. We're going to talk about a much more free and loose topic, a little less scientific topic of how to build authentication into an application, in particular a web application. When you deal with crypto, you're dealing with pure mathematics. When you deal with uh, like building a web application, you deal with the eccentricities of the browser. How secure is the browser in general, historically, would you think? How secure are the web standards that drive web applications? How secure are they built from the ground up? They're not. So we have a relatively insecure browser. We have a weak protocol, HTTP, and we need to apply a good authentication layer for our individual users on top of that, and it's I guess it's less a science than a, an art, or it's a route we've been forced to go down as these applications get attacked. So that's where we're going today. It's kind of an awkward topic. It's a debatable topic. And I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I have two presentations prepared. I have one that goes over the basics, and I have one that talks about hacking authentication that was just given in, in Asia by another OWASP professional who gave me permission to use it. So we'll do as much of that as we have time to do. The best way we can all maximize our time this morning and make the most of our time together is not to just listen to me lecture, is but to stop me and ask questions. Because everything I'm going to talk about is debatable. Everything that I'm going to talk about has counterpoints and has uh, trade-offs like everything else in computer science. So I know you're just waking up. I know you've been out drinking your Guinness till 4 in the morning. You just stumbled in here. But get your coffee up, get your sugar up, and please ask a lot of questions in the next hour and a half. It will, it will benefit us all. Cool? Are you ready to go, everyone? Yeah. I'll accept that. Good job. So what is entity authentication from the perspective of this presentation? We want verification, not of a service or, or another uh, piece of software in our system. We want to authenticate an, an individual human being that they are who they say they are. We're logging into LinkedIn, we're logging into some web application, we're logging into Google, whatever, as an individual. That's what entity authentication is. And what's the difference between authentication and authorization? Ken, what do you think of the spelling of authorization here? I didn't know you were British. Yeah, exactly. This is a, Owen Keary has been, is my co-author of this section, so I apologize to, to the few Americans in here for this misspelling. <laughs> so, Authentication is basically saying, let's let the person in the front door only. Authorization says, well, what rooms are they allowed to go into? What file cabinets can they dig into? Do we let them go into the kitchen or not? So we're going to talk about authentication. This is the login mechanism. This is password storage. It's credential storage. This is session management, session cookie. It's the initial login and how we maintain the state of that login securely, particularly in a web application. So there's three basics here. Um, we're in an era now where I believe password is, is not so effective anymore. So we're in an era where we, we are beginning to consider multi-factor authentication. We, we're going to see John Stephen talk about a password storage tomorrow. It's a really important talk. But I kind of want to trump that conversation respectfully in saying, look, folks, we're in an era, especially the professionals in this room who are moving forward uh, building the next generation applications, do not build a system with username password anymore. It's dead. The password is dead. It's dead. We do not, it's not a good single factor for authentication. So we want to do multi-factor authentication. And this is no longer a nice to have or an additional feature. I think this is a core foundation of what authentication is for next generation developers that we have in this room. What was the biggest hack that we've seen in the last 48 hours? Anyone here checking the news? So we had a major international service whacked hard and was hacked in the last 48 hours. Who was that? Evernote. Evernote. 
So Evernote was storing their passwords in a hashed and salted way. It's a reasonable mechanism for password storage. They weren't doing a work factor. It was not slow, but they were at least using a cryptographic salt, which defeats rainbow table type attacks um, and some dictionary attacks. And so what was their response? Because well, they, they violated the trust of a lot of users. So what was their response last night of what they're going to do moving forward? I'll give you a guess. They're going to implement multi-factor. That was their response. So for me, I, I reestablished trust. That's the response I wanted. I didn't want to hear how they're going to reset my password. I didn't want to hear how they're going to change their password storage mechanism. I wanted to hear that they're going to move to multi-factor authentication. And I talked about this earlier. There's three methods of multi-factor, something you have, like a physical token or a mobile device, something you are, biometrics, and something you know a password. I think that for most of the services we're going to build in this room, Biometrics is not an effective factor. So I have a question for you. What are the, what's the trade-off when you're using biometrics? And when I mean biometrics, what do I mean? Let's, let's take a step back. What are biometrics? Recognition. I'm sorry? Facial recognition. Facial recognition. What else? Fingerprints. Fingerprints. What else? Scan. I'm sorry? Scan. Oh, uh, uh, retinal scan? Sure. Voice? Voice? Sure. One of my favorites are handprint readers, and some of the most secure biometrics I've seen are actually vein print readers. They're looking at the pattern of veins within your hand. Very good entropy in that pattern. All, everything else we talked about, a wave print, how many megabytes is uh, a couple seconds of conversation? Sam, this is for you, Mr. Audio, behind the camera. So if, if I say, hi, this is Jim Manico authenticating, in the most high quality recording you can come up with, how much physical space is that on disk? Not sure, but I think a couple, a couple of bytes. A couple of, maybe like a meg or a couple, or, or like a couple hundred K. How much entropy is a meg? It's not enough. How much entropy is in a retinal scan? Pardon me? I think it's more than that. Ken, do you know how much entropy is in a retinal scan or how much storage we have to have a retinal scan print? That's fair. What are some of the, so that actually could be a good thing then, something like a vein print or a high res retinal scan that may be a reasonable amount of entropy for authentication. What are some of the trade offs though? What are some of the aspects to biometrics that really hurt us when we're trying to implement good authentication over a lifetime of that user? What are some of the flaws of biometrics? I'm sorry? False positive. I actually don't think false positive is as much of the problem, but flip that. Fal not just false positive, but false negative. negative is my big worry with biometrics, where the person is the right person, but it's a retinal scan, and they have allergies, and their, their eyes are, have red eye, and the retinal scan fails. Or in some military installations, they have weight plates, so they measure your weight. And guess, guess when a huge amount of failure in the United States happens for these kind of biometric mechanisms? We have a holiday called Thanksgiving in the United States where we, I don't really know what we celebrate, but we eat a lot of food until we can barely move. And then we go to work. This is a very common American thing. So then we, so then we uh, go, into, uh, go into get authenticated, step on that plate, and there's a huge amount of weight went up because of how we ate crazy the day before, and there's a failure. So a lot of false negatives in the world of biometrics. Now, to really understand the flaws of biometrics, we need to seek the wisdom of Tom Cruise in Tom Cruise movies and Mission Impossible series. So, are you with me on this? So, wh what, what, can't, what can't be done? For, let me take a step back. What key aspect of authentication cannot be done um, when you're using biometrics as a key factor that we need to do in authentication and crypto and key management? Ken. You cannot change that ever. A, your retinal scan today is your retinal scan forever. Your thumbprint changes very little over the course of your life. And th this goes for everything. These, once someone has gotten a copy of that credential, it's game over, not just for one authentication mechanism, but for any authentication mechanism you're using with that biometric. So it's a, I think it's a, 
and there are ways to manage this, but it's really, I don't think we're in an era we're going to use this much for consumer-centric services over, the, over our lifetime is my conjecture. We'll find out. So, and what, does, what do we see in Tom Cruise movies when he needs to break some biometric scheme? What does he do? What do we see in the big spy movies? Pardon me? Either he'll, you know, he'll make a new face. That's not as exciting, though. What else has he done in earlier, earlier movies? There was a retinal scan, and he wanted to... Pardon me? Yeah, he took the eye. He, he, there was a certain individual who he needed his, his credential, and so he, bar, he <laughs> borrowed the eyeball. I'll bring it back and use that to authenticate. So I think that's really funny. I guess I failed in that endeavor to enlighten you with humor. Moving on. <laughs> Yeah, so, actually, let's, let's keep talking about this. So we have a lot of common, very public services that are doing multi-factor authentication right now. Let's, let's break down the Google authentication. What, anyone here using Google and Gmail as a big part of their identity? Hands up. Hands, hands down. Whoa, 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 hands up, hands up if you're using Google. And get ready to put your hands down if you're not using multi-factor. So who here is using multi-factor on Google? Now do this with your hand. Are you ready? Do this. I'm smart. That's right. All of you who are using, are using Gmail as security professionals, what are you going to do in the next 24 hours for us? You're going to turn on, they call it, they call it two-step verification. It's multi-factor. I implore you as security professionals to not just go and turn it on today, but look at how they build this system. And this is a great example of a consumer-centric multi-factor with trade-offs. It's not a perfect system, but it's a great model for consumers. So here's the, yes, sir. Jim, what, what I was bothering me for instance was the, the Google solution is how do you authenticate your I was just about to talk about that, and I agree. This is a, an awkward trade-off that they make, and there's actually been some problems with this mechanism. The, I still think you want to turn it on because it's so much stronger than what you're doing already with just passwords. So let's talk about some of the trade-offs that they made. Um, when you first set up two-factor authentication, they're going to give you e either through SMS or a thick client application, they will uh, uh, let set up a, a software token that changes every 60 seconds. So now when you go to log into Google, you type in your username password, and you type in the token that's on your phone, and they let you authenticate. Now, that works pretty well. The part that is, is in question, though, what about all your other uses of these services? What about your use of thick client webmail or, or thick, thick client email? Or if you're using a contact application that syncs to your Google account? Or if you're using, like I have email on multiple devices and they each have, and, and none of them use multi-factor. So what Google does is they give you a, a one application password. So you go in to your account and you say, I want to, because when you turn on multi-factor for the first time in Google and you have your password into all these different services and they all break, they all stop working right away. So, you, so how do I get that to work? So you log into Google, you say, I want a, a password for one specific application and they'll give you a long, relatively strong password that you use for each individual application. So, that's not multi-factor, that's just a strong password. That's the trade-off that they're making. Now the flaw that was reported about this recently is that these one application keys, or these one application passwords, they can be used repeatedly in different applications. So there's a flaw in how Google implemented this. And they fixed it recently now. So when you build a one-time password and you put it in Thunderbird, if you try to reuse that in Outlook, it will fail. So now, once you first establish it for one application, it's going to be bound to that application only through some kind of signatures they're detecting for that application. Is this perfect multi-factor? No way. This is actually, it breaks a lot of tenets of multi-factor, but it's a really good trade-off for a consumer service where we, by default, have just username passwords. We allow multi-factor as an optional security feature and we still enable easy use of thick client applications through one through application specific passwords. Perfect, no way. A fair trade off for today, I think it's exceptional. We also have Blizzard, I've talked about this in the keynote. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gamer, I like to play video games when my wife gives me permission to do so. Um, 
Am I right? Okay, <laughs> I, I kid you not. What's the hallmark of any good marriage? How, how long have you been married for, sir? How long have you been married for? So have you given up all sense of will and in complete obedience to your wife at this point? No. no? Ah, well, <laughs> boo, boo. We'll have to talk with her later. All right, moving on. So Google, I'm sorry? You're, you're breaking, don't tell them the secret. You're, oh, oh. He wasn't supposed to say that secret. I'm not trying to be offensive to anyone, I'm sorry. So. So World of Warcraft, they, they've been support, a lot of people tell me, oh, I can't support multi-factor, it's too expensive, it's too time consuming to implement. Um, one of my friends works for one of the top social media network, social media websites on the planet, guess how long it took him to implement multi-factor for one of the largest social media companies in the world. His implementation time was about 20 hours of coding. It's not that difficult, it's actually quite easy, I think especially in the era of SMS gateways and the like. So we have World of Warcraft and Blizzard who supported multi-factor for four years. And I joke around, if you're going to protect your magic user and your, and your fighter in World of Warcraft with multi-factor, you sure as heck should protect your multi-billion dollar infrastructure or organization or, or school with multi-factor. I, I, I really believe that the world is not moving to this enough. And this alone is the most important move and change we need to make in our consumer services. In the, in the era of the cell phone, it's much easier to implement this in mass now. So, yes, sir. Yeah, I think also what now is a problem that the mass doesn't do it is, uh, uh, for instance, why I don't use it now on my Gmail account is, uh, now you know, if I want to log in on a different computer, it's just username, password, and I'm logged in. And otherwise, I have to use my password, then I have to wait for for, for Google? Do you, what, kind of, what kind of phone do you have? Uh, phone. You can just get the Google Authenticator application for free and no longer have to use text. It's like a, a soft, it's a soft token. Let me grab mine real quick. So this is available for Android and iPhone. I am not, a, I am not trying to endorse any of these companies. It's just a good model of what authentication is in my objective opinion. You have the Google Authenticate. Don't take a picture of that, Sam. What are you doing? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this changes every minute, so I don't care if you take a picture of it. This, what you see on screen here is not going to be useful in about 30 seconds. And so this is a thick client application that I'm using for my Google account, my, my OWASP account, my Manico.net account, and for Dropbox as well. Dropbox has got some serious problems, and one of the good things about the Google Authenticator mechanism is it... Uh, gives you a server-side Linux component that you can use for your own service as well. So Dropbox implemented multi-factor in almost no time by using Google's mechanism. Is it perfect? No. Is it a step beyond what we do today with just username and password? It's a huge leap. One small step for authentication, one giant leap for good secure applications. So, con so consider making that move to the thick client. I've even, I even have it work, even when my phone is not online, when my phone is off the net, and I just have access to my laptop, I can, it still works just fine. Doesn't require net. Sorry to, I spent like what, 15 minutes on this slide? Sorry about that, folks. And so, that's my spiel on multi-factor. Again, uh, take a look at how Facebook does it, take a look at how Google does it, look how Blizzard does it, and these are great examples of multi-factor that's rolled out, not to thousands of users, but to millions of users in a very effective way. The password is dead. So let's talk about uh, uh, an authenticated session. So HTTP is stateless. And so all web application development is uh, you know, governed by the HTTP protocol in a variety of different ways. So my question to you is, um, what do I mean when I say that the HTTP protocol is stateless? Anyone? Yo? Um, well, when you send a request to an HTTP server, um, it does so with no history. It doesn't, it doesn't know about the previous request. And uh, when it sends its response, then it has seen that that response is sent. So it, it gets no history about that previous response. That's exactly correct. I, I could not have said it better myself. That was very eloquent, Yo. And this is. This is a big problem 
This is, first of all, it's one of the benefits of the web. It's a really trivial, simple protocol. We can look at, the, we can look at this, this protocol by hand uh, with just our eye and understand it the first time we look at it. It's a trivial, simple, easy to implement, uh, relatively uh, scalable protocol. But the problem is every individual request knows nothing about every other request. So when you go to some news website and you load the home page of your average website, how many individual requests does it take to load that website? Think of all the pieces. What, what, what makes up a web page? What, what's the first thing we always load? We go to the, 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 the HTML page. There's one request. I make a request. I get the HTML page. That, and then that connection drops. That's one request. So what else do we have to load? CSS, how many CSS files make up the average complicated mainstream website? Three or four. So those are three to four individual requests that know nothing about each other to load that CSS. That's five requests. What else do we have to load? Pardon me? And how many scripts do the, does the average web page load these days? Especially media sites and news sites, sometimes it doesn't. So there's another 10 requests. So what else do we have to load? Image files, another 10, 20, 30 requests. So here we are loading one web page, and it takes like 50 requests to populate that page. And each one of these requests knows nothing about each other because it's stateless. There's no state built into the protocol like we see in TCP IP and other protocols. So what are we going to do here? Should we, if, it, if this web page is an authenticated web page, should we log in to that web page 50 times? What do you think of that for usability? Survey says, no way. So what do we do? How do we add state after we authenticate to a web page? What do you think the answer is? Session management. And unfortunately, in, in other protocols, the session management is built into the protocol. This is not built in to web. In fact, the whole idea of cookies and session, uh, session management, it's a hack that browsers and it's a hack that developers all happen to agree on. So we have this thing called an HTTP cookie. Is everyone here familiar with what an HTTP cookie is? Let me, let's talk about this. This is really important. Again, if, if, is, is this too basic? Is, this, is it good to go over the basics here in detail for the room? Or are you thinking, I know all this stuff already. Please, please stop, Jim. Who, who says good, good so far? Who honestly is thinking a little bit too basic? So I'm going to keep, I'm gonna keep the good refresher. A very politically minded answer. <laughs> Cheers. I like that. So let's get into cookies and the life cycle of a cookie. So first of all, when you make a request to, let's say you're making a request to a, an advertisement or an av uh, some kind of a merchant. So you make that request anonymously, and what you get back in the response from that merchant is a response with a header that says, set cookie. So I made a request to some LAMPS website, and I get the response with HTML, and one of the headers in that response is a cookie, set cookie call. And it's some kind of long random string in that cookie often to track what I'm doing. And I haven't even logged in yet, and they're still tracking me. This is very common for an e-commerce site. Amazon does this. They want to see what items you look at so they can give you proper targeted advertising even before you log in. So I now have this cookie. Amazon, I made a request to Amazon's homepage. They give me a cookie, and now that cookie is stored in my browser. So every time in that browser that I go back to that domain, the cookie gets automatically attached to my request the server sees the cookie in the request, recognizes the ID, I gave them that ID, and then we have state now. We can track the user from request to request. And so, is this cookie trusted? Is the data we, is, when, you're on, when you're a server and you get the cookie back to the server, is that trusted data? No way, it's not. How much, you're up, how much of the request can we trust?
Exactly. Or I, as an attacker, when you assign me a session ID, I can just modify it myself. I can start, I, I've seen people who basically put session state, like the user ID, the role, in a cookie. And they think it's trusted. Well, I, as the attacker, I can just open that cookie. It's a text file in your browser, and I can change it any way you want. So the first thing I want to suggest is really minimize what you put in that cookie. Keep it to a session ID only. That's usually the best use of a cookie. So back, we're back to the server, back to the story. I'm on the server. I get this cookie, this long random ID. I see it in my lookup table somewhere. I can now provide state for that user. This is the hallmark of session management and state on the web. And here's the funny thing. Cookies, are cookies a formal standard as part of the HTTP standard? They're not. There's no, no the, the HTTP says nothing about cookies. A couple years, I'm not trying to toot my own, I started a working group to make cookies a standard a couple years ago. Other people took it over, I'm not a part of it. But I, I, I just a couple years ago, I'm like, all right, let's, let's, I'm gonna go read about cookies in the RFC for HTTP. It's not here. The only thing I can find is some old spec from Netscape from like 20 years ago. So to this day, cookies drive the heart of authentication on the web, yet there's no standard for it. It's just a hack that browsers and developers and languages and frameworks happen to agree on. It drives me mad, but that's the truth of what's happening today. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself. I got two, how, how, far, how much time do I have, yo? So I did two slides in a half an hour. I probably should kick it up a little bit. All right. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So, so what is an authenticated session? We have the random session ID. It's the server delivers it to the browser in, the, in a response. And every request back to that domain automatically attaches the cookie to that request. It's usually valid for a finite period of time. We can specify an expiration time on the cookie. So here's a quiz question, bonus points. The winner of this gets a free trip to Hawaii and a free Ferrari. Are you ready? What was my question? Hang on. So if I'm, I want to do session expiration, right? I want to make sure that the session ID is only good for a certain amount of time. So as a programmer, I'm going to set in the cookie an expiration date to be 24 hours from the time of delivering the cookie. What do you think of that? What's wrong with that? I'm setting a cookie expiration time, and after 24 hours, the browser will automatically delete that cookie. That will actually work. Is that good security? Is that a good pattern? You naysayer. I can't go past this line. I'm sorry. Go ahead. One more time. What if it's just, what if it's, what if it's just uh, um, a set timeout in the cookie for three hours? So we have a expiration time that's flagged in the cookie so after three hours that cookie goes away what's wrong with that pattern it's not, not just that that Frenchman's right where are you from Belgium I'm sorry to call you Frenchman this this good this good man is exactly correct the problem with this pattern is is that you're setting the cookie timeout in the cookie, which is not trusted data. And I can open up that text file, but I can change the expiration time to be in the year 2074, and, and it works. The cookie will stay alive for that amount of time. So how do we do session timeouts? Not in the cookie, we need to do that server side. I just want you to think of, even though we're depending on cookies, even though it's the heart of authentication and session management on the web, even though HTTP is stateless and we need this, it's an untrusted text file on our, on our browser that can be modified by a threat agent with ease. So keep that in mind. This will come up a lot. So let's, let's, what's the workflow of, of good authentic and, um, authentication on the web? Let's look at this. We have a login form. So something's missing here. So I'm about to display to a user a login form. What are some of the characteristics that we should have within this login form? That's very debatable. I'm going to get into an argument about you. I agree with, first of all, yo, I think you're right. I'm going to get into an argument with you about that, a polite argument with you about that in just a moment. Are you ready? You ready for that? You ready? I agree with you, so I just want to take the other, other position. 
So Yo is saying that the login form should be over HTTPS. And very few, uh, I think a large number of sites don't agree with Yo. What they do is they make the login form over HTTP, but they make sure that that form submits over HTTPS. That's the choice that, I, that most websites that I see make Yo. And I call that a security vulnerability when you do that. So let's get into it. Why is rendering a login form, even a login form that submits over HTTPS, but why is a login form that gets rendered in HTTP a bad security choice? This is exactly, these are both correct. So let's, take, let's talk about HTTPS for a moment. What are the three major benefits you get when you implement HTTPS? Three cryptographic benefits. I'm sorry? Uh, not authentication, but auth authenticity. When we're using HTTPS and we go to bankofgym.com, everyone's favorite bank, you know for sure that's the right bank because of the authentic authenticity applied, uh, provided by the CA system where, you, where the server, Bank of Jim, got that certificate from. So because of that, in theory, we get some kind of authenticity. What else do we get? I'm sorry? We get confidentiality, which means no one can sniff our conversation. No one can see into our conversation. We get one more ma major benefit. What's that? Integrity. Integrity. That means that um, no, one can mod even if, no one can modify our, our communications without disrupting the communication. So we get authenticity. We know we're at the right server. We get integrity. No one can modify our transmission. And we get confidentiality. No one can see our transmission. So think of this in the context of HTTP rendering a login form. So if we're rendering a login form over an insecure communication, what do we no longer have? We no longer have authenticity. We don't know if we have the right server. We no longer have confidentiality. Anyone can see our communication. That's not a big deal. But more importantly, we no longer have integrity. Folks can now modify that form in transit, maybe modify the location of where it's getting sent to, or maybe add some JavaScript that logs every keystroke. So I, yo, I think you're right on. Login pages need to be rendered over HTTPS. Step one. Step two, we submit the credentials. So how should this work according to the, what we talked about earlier? How should, what should we be submitting and how should we be submitting it? Username, password, and multi-factor token, right? And how should we be submitting it? Over, over secure channel. Perfect. Next, we have creation of session. The, I'm sorry? Oh. Yo, raise your right hand. High five. Yo is exactly correct. Let's take a step back. I missed this. So under session credential submission, we need to submit this over an HTTP, HTTPS post. Because if you're submitting credentials, even over an HTTPS get, those credentials leak. They leak out of your screen. They'll be in the URL bar. They sometimes leak in browser history. They sometimes leak over a refer header. Um, they leak often in proxy servers, even over HTTPS. So yo, bonus points for pointing that out. That's, that's a critical point. Yes? G Sam, give, g g get yo in the camera here. Get, Yo, give us a, give us a, yeah, yo, he's listening. Right on, yo. We should, we need to submit over a post here. This is critical, an HTTPS post, good catch. Now on the server, we're creating a session. We're basically building a lookup table. We're building a database, basically, that has a long session ID in one column, and the user ID in another column, and the expiration, the idle timeout time in another column, basically, or the login time so we can idle time it out. And so we, we create a session on the server, we put it in some kind of lookup table, and we then take the session ID, put it in a cookie, and send it over the wire in a secure response, and the browser and the server has an agreement, it will save that cookie, 
and only send it back to request back to that domain. And then you do cool things. You post to Facebook pictures of your dancing cats like I do, um, or you do, your, you do your Harlem Shake videos and you post them to Facebook, whatever you're doing, right? And then you try to do something that's cool but dangerous. And so we force the user to reauthenticate. This control is not used enough in the world. We want to do reauthentication is such a strong control that defeats so many kinds of attacks that I want to encourage you to do it more. We got to be surgical about this. We got to be surgical. Give me an example of when you want to force an authenticated user to reauthenticate on the spot. I'm sorry. On on payment, maybe. Here's a key. Here. Maybe. I, I, I'll, let me get back to that. Like changing, password. changing password. Right? Whenever we want to change our password, we, we want to say old password, old, old multi-factor token, new password, new password. Or more, let me try that again. When we want to change our password. It should be old password, current multi-factor token, new password, new password. Boom, and it changes. Great. What's that? That's so I, because of your accent, I want to say, this is a real smart Frenchman, but I can't say that. How do I say, so what, a, a real smart Belgian man, how do I say that? Belgiumer? What's the word? Is there a word for that? No? Beer drinker. This is a very smart beer drinker. Very good. <laughs> and so, uh, what did you just say? What was that? <laughs> Edit profile. Very few sites do this. It drives me mad. Think of the heart of your authenticity. It's your email address as well. You can trigger a forgot password with that email address. So most sites I see, I'm authenticated, and I go, edit email address. Let me edit my email address and my core identity information. And they let me just do it. That should always be protected by a reauthentication check. Because very often, if you can maliciously change someone's email address, then you can hijack the whole account through uh, password reset often. And so we want to, we want to make sure that, um, again, the password reset, profile editing is protected by reauthentication. What else? Let's, let's go back to you. So in banking, I think one of the more important defenses that's emerging is behavioral now, uh, behavior measurement, behavior, um, get, use, getting a user profile on how they use your site. We see grandma, my grandma, every Friday at 4 o'clock her time. She gives me $10 in my account because I'm doing good in school. And I'm like, grandma, I'm 40 and I'm not in school anymore. Oh, it's okay, Jimmy. I hear you're getting A's. Okay, thanks, grandma, for that $10. So over, over time, Grant, we have a profile on grandma. She logs in every Friday at about 4 o'clock. And then she transfers $10 to little Jimmy. Grandma, I'm not so little anymore. Oh, you need to eat more, Jimmy. Oh, thanks, Grandma. All right. Um, she and, and she's really slow. She logs, she types in her username, hits submit. 30 seconds later, her password lands, and she hits submit. Two minutes later, she gets to the account. She's really slow. She takes her time when she clicks. Listen to Vivaldi, I think, while she does it. I don't know. And, she, and so we have this pro, and we can measure that statistically. And so if all of a sudden I see Grandma making a purchase at insert inappropriate site X here, and it's for $5,000, and she's transferring it to Yugoslavia uh, is, is a, a delivery address. That's kind of not how grandma rolls usually. We may want to flag that and actually lock the transaction and do a, vo and do a uh, verbal authentication check and call her or force her to call in because it's out of the, or, or do something beyond the norm to authenticate her in a stronger way or delay the transaction for a couple days, um, a lot of different things we can do. Let's, look at, let's talk about Amazon for a second, though. Let me change the conversation. So Amazon, I think, does a really good job at enforcing reauthentication throughout the e-commerce lifecycle. One, one of the things that addresses what you're talking about is when do they force you to reauthenticate a purchase? Because normally you log in once, complete your purchase, and you're done, and they log you off automatically at the end of, of a purchase. Reasonable choice. But there are certain times they make you log in twice. You log in once when you try to start the e-commerce portion of your checkout. And when do they always force you to log in again? Yes, exactly. 
if you try to ship an item to an address that you've never shipped to before, you gotta log in again, sorry about that. That is an excellent choice, I think, because in the normal workflow of standard Amazon users, they're gonna send to the same group of people or themselves, it's a, a known safe address. The only people who get affected by this reauthentication is the, the ab abnorm ab abnormal <laughs> use of the site, the odd case, not the common case. So uh, I think that's a good choice for reauthentication. Helpful? Anywhere else we should reauthenticate? I think those are the big ones right there. So now we have absolute timeout. What's absolute timeout? Let, 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 actually, let's, let's talk about this second. Let's talk about idle timeout. What is idle timeout in the world of session management? Right, when you're inactive, like you've logged into Gmail and you just close your browser and you go watch TV. That session is still active on the server, but you've shut down your browser and you're doing something else. After a certain amount of time, we, uh, the, the server will inactivate that session because you stopped using it. This is a really common defense. It's called idle timeout. It's easy to implement. For banking, idle timeout, I've seen as low as 10 minutes. And for other services with remember me functions, I've seen that idle timeout be months. And so I, I think you want to err on, especially for financial sites and very high security sites, you want to err on the side of making that idle timeout as low as possible. Um, what's absolute timeout? Here's the problem with idle timeout. In the era of modern web applications, as long as you have that page open, that page is alive and active and using your network often. It's pulling back to the server looking for more data. It's uh, refreshing the page automatically for cer in certain sites. So if you have a web page open, it's very off. It, that page, even when you physically do nothing to that page, it's still active behind the scenes, keeping that session ID open and restricting idle timeout from firing off as long as the web page is open. So there's another control that I think is becoming, much, becoming more and more important in the era of web 3.0 and mobile, whatever you want to call it. And that's absolute timeout. So what's absolute timeout? Sorry? It's a, the ceiling. So we think of absolute timeout, uh, uh, idle timeout is the floor. If you're going to be inactive for a few minutes, I shut you down. Absolute timeout's the opposite. That even if you're fully active nonstop for X amount of hours, I'm going to make you log in again anyways. So we're limiting the life of a session uh, in two ways. And I think this is important control. Very few frameworks support absolute timeout. And so I think this value should be relatively low as well. At least for me, I'm very rarely on a website more than an hour or so. So for high security sites, I may have an idle timeout of 10 minutes and an absolute timeout of just an hour or two. And, that's, and sometimes that's OK. For a site like Facebook that encourages you to stay on for a long amount of time, that may not be nearly as effective. But and it's really difficult to give you an answer of what absolute timeout should be. It depends on the site. But it's a control I think you should consider. And if a framework doesn't support this, how do you implement it yourself? I conject that we can implement, um, I conject that we can implement absolute timeout in one line of code in a filter. Anybody want to give that, a, give that a try? We need the variables current time, and we need the variables absolute value, absolute length, absolute timeout length, and we need the variable um, current time. So login time, current time, and absolute timeout length. So what's the formula to pull that off? If the current time is greater than the login time plus the absolute value length then log and kill that person's session on the spot. So it's rather easy to implement this on your own in a filter if your framework does not support it. So, okay, what do we got here? Session identifiers. Um, once a user's logged in, we deliver a session ID to them. Um, each request back to the server will automatically attach the session ID. Yes, sir. Yeah, with the uh, absolute timeout, uh, don't you think if you have a website that's already existing and uh, you go to implement it, that the users will be annoyed that uh, they are suddenly out of line and they have to be authenticated? 
you're exactly correct. If you implement absolute timeout or idle timeout or reauthentication too aggressively, you harm usability dramatically. So we have to do this prudently. So maybe you look at the average login time. Maybe you look at statistics on your existing site to see how long the average user stays logged in for. You track logout. You see. You look at login logout, and after your study, it's one quick query usually. You see the average user is on your site for three hours because they love, you know, they love looking at your cookie recipes. You're a great baker. They love your cookie recipes. And, uh, you, and of course, they're your cookie recipes, so you build a highly secure site and strong authentication and strong crypto to protect your cookie recipes, of course. And uh, you see at max the users use your site for like five to six hours at most. And so maybe you set the, idle, the absolute timeout to be eight hours. It's not going to harm usability. But it still locks, it still limits how long that session's open for. And it really depends. I'm, I'm giving you one of many scenarios. It depends. And so uh, for reauthentication, if you forced every single uh, e-commerce checkout to have multiple layers of reauthentication, that's a lot of money out of your pocket. People are like, forget this, and they move on. So you have to be really judicious about applying these controls. And that's the I mean, to implement idle and absolute timeout is easy. That's the easy part of computer science. Doing it in a way that doesn't harm usability, that's incredibly difficult to do. I don't have an easy answer there. Just do your studies. I see a lot of people doing A-B testing. So if you have a very large site with hundreds of thousands of active users, maybe you want to roll this feature out to a small percentage of users and measure how it affects um, your site and your and what you're trying to accomplish on that site. But that's a really good point you're making. That doesn't mean, no, we shouldn't do it. We should just do it judiciously and, and with metrics to back up our choice as much as we can. And don't start some metrics battle with me, yo. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> we had a fun, heated conversation on metrics last night. I like that. And so here's the problem. If someone steals, if someone steals or guesses a session ID, and it's, that session ID is still active, then the, um, a threat agent, the attacker, can hijack that account. Now, the attacker can't log into that account, but the attacker can stay authenticated to that account as long as the session remains active. And so absolute timeout can help here. Hijack, uh, imagine this. This is the ideal scenario in my mind. We have good reauthentication set up to protect critical features. We have absolute timeout set up, and all of a sudden the attacker still is able to hijack a session ID. Ha ha, the attacker has your account. And he goes in, edit profile, I'm changing the email address. Oh, I have to reauthenticate, and I'm done. I'm locked out now. After you reauthenticate, what should you do? You should change the user session ID. Let's, re let's go back a step. To implement reauthentication correctly, any time a user logs back in successfully, you invalidate the old session and regenerate a new session ID. This will help strengthen the mechanism to stop attacks like session fixation, where the attacker may have a known active session ID. And so imagine the attacker stealing your session. He, tr he tries to change the password. He doesn't know it, and he goes back, and he's that session's gone because it's been recycled. Or imagine if the attacker steals your session and uh, he starts to do things, look at your site, and all of a sudden the session expires because of absolute timeout. So when you add these additional controls judiciously, judiciously it, limits the, it limits the damage that can be done from a session hijack type of attack. Again, it's like the, the onion all together. We, and session IDs are, oh yeah, we know that it's a cookie, and this is usually transparent to the developer. I agree with that. Usually struts, spring, PHP, they all have a, a reasonable session management mechanism built in. If you need, if, who here is a Java programmer? Who here, and uh, uh, so Java programmers, this uh, session management gets really tough when you start doing things like high availability computing, you have large clusters throughout the world, and suddenly session management that comes out of the box is no longer effective. So doing really advanced cluster-based, high availability session management. I use a software package called Apache Shiro, which has an outstanding session management mechanism built into it. This is a security library that um, was created by Les Hazelwood out of San Francisco and is 
actively maintained by a large community. And so th that's what I want in my security library. I want it to be written by top tier developer experts, and I want it to be under a good governance like the Apache Foundation, and I want it to be actively maintained. And I see that in Apache Shiro, which is why I'm, I've been recomm and I'm, and, uh, which I'm, I'm recommending it uh, to developers as a good open source security library. So some dangers, let's look at some attacks. So storing a password in plain text. What do you, how do we deal, how do we fix that problem? How do we store our passwords? A hash by itself? What do you think about, what do you think about storing a password in like MD5? The MD5 was created for password storage, what's wrong with that? Uh, the, yeah, the, 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 the direct risk against using MD5 alone is a rainbow table again. Go Google MD5 crack. There is an online service that will resolve MD5 hashes for free up to about 12 character passwords. There's one in the UK as well. We can write our own MD5 cracker with ease. When MD5 was created, a megabyte of storage was expensive. It's almost free today. And so you can build a rainbow table of pre-computed hashes for passwords up to about 12 characters and about 100 terabytes of data without any kind of like optimization or hash chaining, just doing it raw and boom, MD5 is dead. So we want to use, what we recommend today are hashing, salting, and a work factor. And so the traditional recommendation over the last couple of years is to make it one way, put a cryptographic salt in to defeat rainbow tables, and then purposely make the algorithm really, really slow so attackers who get this can use a, use a dictionary attack to defeat it. Now, we're going to hear John Stevens talk about this tomorrow. I think it's a really important talk because if you listen to that advice, then you're computing and you're like a huge bank. You need like a mountain of servers to handle that slowing factor just for logging in. This idea that the industry tells us doesn't work at scale. And so other tr more tried and true crypto like HMAX is something that I think is a, a better choice. I'm really eager to see what John says about this tomorrow. If you like this topic, go look at it. But the state of the art up till today is to use a salted slow algorithm like Bcrypt or Scrypt. That tends to be the most common recommendation. And I'm skeptical that that's a good recommendation at great scale. But even better, store your password in plain text. Just do multi-factor authentication. If you're doing multi-factor authentication right, the need to store your password in a rigorous way completely drops off. And that's something that John told me, and he's, and he's like, I can't believe I'm doing all this research on password storage. It's like telling people who are high-speed motorcycle users to wear a helmet. What, hap what happens if, you're a mo if you ride a motorcycle and you, you unfortunately get into an accident while going 200 kilometers an hour? How helpful is your helmet? It's not. You're a schmear, like a bagel, a schmear on a bagel at that point. So, and I agree with John. When you're like a big bank and you're doing really rigorous password storage, that's putting a helmet on a motorcycle driver who's going at incredibly high speeds. When an accident happens, it's not going to help you. So stay tuned for that topic. So password policy. We, what are we telling users about their password policy? What do we say? Give me an example of, of what you consider to be a good Password policy. So, so next case, use an upper and lower case letter. So one one number. What else? I'm sorry. At least six. At least at least six characters. That's more than that, probably eight characters at least. So eight characters, alphanumeric, use a number in there, use a non-alphanumeric character in there. What else?
I'm about to critique it radically. I agree with you, yo, I do. And so we, 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 if you look at the mathematics of password strength, it's the number of, char number of possible characters in secret to the length of the password. So mathematically, the most important uh, password strength factor is the length of your password, no question about it. And so, but the, the point I'm trying to make is, what are we basically telling, when we look at most modern password policies, what are we telling users essentially? Please create a password that you have absolutely no chance of remembering. And this is like, what are we doing here? This is craziness. It's, and it's not, I think what we're doing around passwords is not effective. So again, what am I going to talk about? Multi-factor authentication. When you're doing multi-factor authentication, how you store a password and what your password policy should be can drop radically. In fact, uh, Schneier said that if you have a good multi-factor in play, then you can have a good password policy that's only four bytes, four, or four characters, and that's good enough in the face of good multi-factor. I'm not sure if that's true, but it's still, it, 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 begs, it backs up the point that you do multi-factor, these problems go away. So in a lot of ways, I think multi-factor makes authentication development not harder. I feel it makes it easier in a lot of ways. So um, we also want to avoid username harvesting. Username harvesting is when I can scrape usernames off of your website, right? And so early versions of eBay had a big problem around this. So eBay wanted to stop people who were brute forcing accounts. How do you, what control do we need in authentication to, uh, to stop brute force? I think, I think CAPTCHA is more of a work, a cost factor. It's not a security control. We can defeat CAPTCHA by, um, um, we can defeat CAPTCHA by, oh, what's it called again? The, what's the service at Amazon? The Turkish? Uh, Mechanical Turk, thank you. So we can defeat CAPTCHAs with Mechanical Turk services. So right now, go look up CAPTCHA defeating services. It's like software as a service. They'll provide you an API. You push a CAPTCHA to the service. They'll charge you a fraction of a penny and give you the answer. And behind the scenes of that web service, there's like a team of like a thousand people working in a country where people are inexpensive, just resolving captures for a fraction of a penny all day long. And so if a person can defeat it, then we can defeat it. And I'm, I'm not even kidding. These services exist. Um, and so you, you just can't depend on a capture for good security. Now, it is a cost factor. If the attacker wants to defeat captures all day long while he's trying to break your um, brute force your account, you usually have to spend a good amount of money for every capture resolution. So it's a cost factor, still reasonable to use. So where was I though? I was talking about username harvesting. We're on eBay. And early versions of eBay, the, the usernames were, when you were looking at an item that people were bidding on, they would show everyone that you're bidding against. And so uh, early versions of eBay, they had a lot of antiquities dealers, like trade, like, the, oh, we have this, this chair. Is Louis the fifth chair, Louis something's chair, and it's worth 50,000 euros. And wow, we need this chair. So whatever. So uh, no offense to those who like old chairs. But, uh, and so they would bid on these chairs. And there's a real heated, like there's not many of these chairs around. Louis himself sat in this chair. There's only one of them in existence. I need this chair. So people would bid on these chairs. Now, suppose you were evil. And you see everyone else who's bidding on this chair, and you know that eBay does account lockout because you forgot your password and you got locked out in the past. How could you ensure that this chair would be yours? <laughs> what would you do? Maybe a, a couple, you write a little script, and like 10 seconds before the bid ends, you lock everyone out and you do one final bid and you win every single time. So, what has e eBay done to mitigate that attack on their, on their system? You no longer see the username of people who you bid against. They show the first letter, dot, 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 and the last letter only, so, so it's, a, it's not certain who it is you're bidding against. That's one way to protect against username harvesting. You obscure the username. What's another way to stop username harvesting? Or a better question. What's another place that we can attack the system and, and harvest usernames out of the system? 
I'm sorry? Yeah, the login screen is a common place that we see this. So in the login screen, um, suppose you type in a username, you type in a password, you hit submit, and what kind of error message would you get back if it's not a good password? They'll say, they may say password failure, or they may say username does not exist. And then you try a good password and they say password has failed. What does that tell you as an attacker? That tells you if an attempted username, even without the correct password, is good or not. Correct? So we want to say in our, lo in our login failure messages, we want to say logout failed and don't say why. And, if you want, if it's a, and for some systems, when the logout fails, we sometimes see an email go to that user and says, someone tried to log into your account and failed. And, so, and I like that myself for high security systems inform the user when his account is under attack. Um, it's like IDS and IPS a la cheap. Get the users to do it for you. So now suppose we do that right. Suppose we limit username harvesting by giving a good logout message and not displaying usernames in the site itself. There's another way I can attack a system to reveal a username by doing a timing attack against the login page. This is when I try a username per login and I measure the response time as, as best. Oops, this is when I um, make a request to a website on the login page with a username I'm trying to see if it's active or not and I measure the response time in that response. So if it's a good username, I try to log in, they look up the username, they look up the hash, they see the password that I do, hash and salt it, do a comparison, and if they don't match, then we say logout failed. That may take one to two seconds on average. Now suppose I try a username that doesn't exist. We try the username, we look it up, it doesn't exist, return a response, logout failed. That may only take half a second on average. So by trying many attempts and measuring the response time, I can use a timing attack to determine if a username is good or not. How do I stop that? You use like a sleep or some kind of delay in bad usernames to make sure that on average a bad username and a good username um, responds in the same amount of time. We, we were doing testing at our own company against a site that really wanted to protect against this vulnerability. And we found that the timing was about the same, everything, other, all the protections existed, but when the username was bad, there was an extra space in the message. It was logout failed, that we could see an extra and a non-breaking space in there, and so by that tiny mistake, we were able to do great username harvesting against the site. So be careful here. Now, suppose you do all of this right. You get your timing attack defense in, you get your username, uh, username obscuring put in, and the proper logout message, and you got all this working perfectly. How can I still easily do username harvesting against a site with ease? If you have a, a certain kind of feature on your site, username harvesting will always be possible. What feature is that? And you're Bang, exactly. He's exactly correct. So if you're a consumer-centric site and you provide a registration page, there's almost always a feature. What's your username you're going to type in? And as you type in the username you want to use, what do they usually tell you on the spot? It's Ajax. You don't even have to hit submit. It's Ajax. I'll just do a quick check. Username in use already. And now I could just look at that little Ajax endpoint, and I got a high-performance Ajax username harvesting tool, and I got you. I can rip, rip them out all day long. And so this is the point I'm trying to make. We see a lot of people spending all this effort doing username harvesting protection for no reason, for absolutely no reason if you have a registration page. So don't build controls for the sake of building controls. Do it in the right context. And so if you're a high security site, you don't take usernames from users. You assign that user a username. And you don't even allow registrations. You assign it to them, like a university giving a student an account, something like that. And then username, then you really can protect from username harvesting. It's a, a story I enjoy. 
How about weak forgot password? I'll talk about the forgot password workflow in just a bit. Forgive me for sitting down. I have a, I, I have a sprained ankle. Can you guys see me okay? Are you okay if I sit down for the next? Cool. Question about this kind of. Please, please. Putting the ID on the user. Like, let's say you are registering yourself, but then the registration number you are getting, I think if you are getting just a number which is random, yeah. it's quite hard to remember it, or you always have to store it somewhere. If you get, on the other hand, just a counter or something like this, then you just right away know what kind of uh, users are already existing. Yeah, I agree with you. So it's. And even if you are assigning a username in your site, there's usually some kind of pattern. First letter, last name, or student ID, which is usually just a sequence of numbers. So I agree with you. Username harvesting protection is incredibly difficult. It's usually not a place that I spend a lot of effort doing. If I have a registration page, I don't even think about it. If I'm really trying to lock down a site, I may use a cryptographically strong user ID and users hate that. So it's, again, this is, I see a lot, of, a lot of older books talk about this and to your point and my point, it's usually defeatable regardless. So, yes sir. What do you think about password managers that you have like a lot of them so that you can basically get a problem becomes a local problem but then you can use yeah, arbitrary or much more difficult usernames and passwords Oh yeah, I never thought of that. So using a password manager to have really um, cryptographically strong usernames, great idea. And you're, a, you're a, I officially mark you now as being a hyper paranoid security guy. That's good. Someone taught me something yesterday. It's like, do you suffer from paranoia as a security professional? I don't suffer from paranoia. I enjoy every minute of it, right? <laughs> Who, was that, is that a Kenism? Is that from Ken? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to steal that. I like that quote a lot. So, yeah, that's reasonable. Even better than that, though, just do multi use, turn on multi-factor. I think better, stronger than a password manager, because that's still a static password that doesn't change, is multi-factor, where you have a different pass. Every 60 seconds, you have a different password. That's my preference. That's my preference. Cool? So how about a weak change password feature? Um, yeah, so we have two problems with change password. We have a problem with change password where the old credential is not being required. So if someone hijacks your account or you, you left yourself logged in on some public terminal, which you shouldn't use anyways, and someone sits down and gets to your account, hits change password, and they can just specify a new password, game over. There's also access control problems around change password. I'm going to keep charging here if that's all right, Sam. Sure. There we go. So here, here's another major problem around um, your password reset. I very often see password reset done with a hidden ID, with a hidden variable. So when you submit the form, there's the current user ID as a hidden variable, the old password, the new password, and the new password. And so I saw one flaw where they would check server side what the session was, what the current user was, but they would actually use the, the hidden ID to drive change password. So I would do old password, new password, new password for my account, but I can change the hidden ID and change anyone else's password. So there's also uh, the application quit unexpected. Help us diagnose and fix. What the <laughs> <laughs> Not my code, yo, I swear. <laughs> if it was my code, I'd charge a lot to fix it. This is awesome. It's like Mission Impossible 6. <laughs> Any questions so far? And, and, and how, how is this conversation, or, or how is this lecture, right, more accurate? Is this stuff that you all know already, or is this, this is, or this is a good conversation of some new stuff? What's the, what do you think? So far, so good? Yeah, I'm yeah. filling in my book with things to, to check at home. So who, who here is like, I knew all of this already, but I'll stay here anyways. 
who, who, I'm curious, who, 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 for who is this information stuff that you know already and that you're very familiar with? Anyone? Good? So, so reasonable? Yeah, listen, yeah, go to, let's go to PowerPoint. Just fire up again. We're okay with that. That's a fear. <coughs> Yo, being interrupted by you is a, it's a gift, so come, on, come up and visit anytime. <laughs> <coughs> so we have not just re-authentication issues with change password, we also have access control problems around doing uh, change password correctly. The form you submit for change password should only have <coughs> old password, new password, new password, and you should only up, only uh, apply that to the user server side um, uh, with using the session to check who that user is. Really strong systems I've seen where you change the password, they check server side who the active user is, then they send you an email to confirm that change password. That's it. It's for you know, more secure sites is not an unreasonable choice. Session management danger. Session fixation. So session fixation is when I, as the attacker, basically assign the session ID to another user. This is only possible when a vulnerability like session rewriting exists in your site. Anybody ever hear of session rewriting? URL rewriting, it's often called. This is when you can put a session ID on a URL and it works. Older versions of Java did this. A session ID should only be sent over an HTTP, preferably in the cookie, or if you need to in a post for whatever reason. But uh, um, session fixation happens when I hit your website and now you give me a session ID. I put that session ID in a URL and I email you this URL and I say, $50 off lamps today. And you're like, Lamps, I need to buy a lamp. You click on that link that has a session ID on it, and uh, you then go to the site and authenticate, and I now know your session ID. I assigned it to you, so it was one that I was given by the server, and I can now wait for you to log in and hijack your session. Now, this doesn't happen as much anymore. Most of the modern Java frameworks no longer support uh, URL rewriting, but regardless, it's a good habit. When, you, when a user successfully logs into your site, or when a user begins, not succeeds, but begins to re-authenticate on your site for a sensitive feature, immediately invalidate the old session and generate a new session for that user. It avoids uh, various session fixation attacks and strengthens your use of re-authentication. You also want to be careful about weak or, predictable, weak or predictable sessions. In Java, you have a configuration setting that will let you grow the size of the session ID. So Sir. You say session fixation is only if you are really rewriting. You can actually do the same with uh, process scripting as well. So you can actually say, I have a session ID, I inject it by process scripting. So people will say, why, why is it uh, really a risk? Because if you have session XSS on your website, you can already steal the cookie. Well, in certain sites, you might have XSS before you authenticate. Oh, no, so you can overwrite the cookie through XSS with you the known session ID. You have own cookie, and afterwards, the user is logging in, and you have a session. Cheers to that. Good point. So the, so the moral of the story is, when a user successfully logs into your site, or when a, or when a user begins the process of reauthentication, you invalidate you invalidate the old session, migrate that session data to a new session server side, and then generate a new session ID for that user, and the, set, the problem of fixation goes away. He was like 100,020. Okay, so I logged off and logged back in. Session ID was 100,030. And so, and, that, and, and that's not a good session. <laughs> that's bad entropy, it's predictable, and it's sequential. That's bad. So we, we tend to want to use our framework session mechanism. Um, we had problems in PHP that Sammy Kunkar found that their session generation mechanism was not as random as it should have been. And uh, so if you really are worried about more cryptographically strong sessions, I take a look again at Apache Shiro, very well done. You can also increase the default Java session size. I think it's 20 bytes by default. You can increase that relatively easy through configuration. We have session hijacking. We have to be immune to cross-site scripting, which as we talked about earlier, it's a big pain to do so. Do cross-site <coughs> scripting, someone can grab the cookie and shoot it off to a different site with relative ease. 
So all things we've talked about, good. So credential defenses, we talked about this. These are, these are places that we want to re-authenticate, shipping to a new address during password reset, the initial login. Um, significant or anomalous transactions. Again, behavioral analysis of users who use your sites is critical, especially in the banking world. A lot of people are racing with solutions and ideas to measure how a user behaves on your site so we can add additional controls when they behave anonymous, uh, um, uh, anomalously, not anonymously, anomalously on your site using activity that's very dangerous that that user normally does not do. Very difficult to get this right. And if you set the bar too high, you have massive customer service costs to handle this kind of problem. So again, it's not just the, it's talking about the control is easy. Talking about how to surgically apply it is incredibly difficult. I don't have all the answers there. Um, I'm pretty sure John does. Talk to him. Hi, John. Thank you. <clears throat> you were late. You have a note from your mother? You do? Okay. <laughs> it's good to see you. Hello. Um, also, this, uh, the re-authentication also completely stops cross and crest forgery cold. This is another important thing. So if you have a highly sensitive feature and you have to be vulnerable by cross and request forgery, someone can host that form on a different site and that form uh, is submitted maliciously. If you have re-authentication in play, it stops that attack even without the proper nonces in play to stop CSRF. So that's another interesting thing about re-authentication. It gives you so much defense from so many things. I don't think it's used enough. And to your point, you turn that on too much and users will go elsewhere. So it's a tough balance. And what do we say here? Tough balance. Overly strong policy is bad. I, that's what I'm trying to say. What else do we have here? We know that we want to use HTTPS. We want to use HTTPS from the moment a user first renders the login page until they're done logging off. Every, because we need the session ID protected, the entire authenticated session should be over HTTPS. There are some people who think that the whole web should be HTTPS. I don't agree for performance reasons. And uh, I like the Amazon. When you use Amazon and you're just, you're just shopping, it's over HTTP. And as soon as you begin the e-commerce process to check out, it's over HTTPS. That's, very, that's a necessary division um, over, over the web, so I, I think it's reasonable. Jim? Yes? So, how would you advise people if they're in a mixed environment, HTTPS, HTTP, <coughs> to track users across boats, uh, sessions, do they need a different session identifier that you cross link at their server side? How, how would you deal with that? If you're going back and forth between HTTP and HTTPS, it's brutal. But I think, if, but if it's only one or the other, so you keep them over eight, so you have given the first session ID, and you can do the over HTTP because it's not an authentication session, it's just a tracking session to see how they use your site. They haven't logged in yet, they're just shopping and shopping, and looking at your Thai website, ties that you can buy from me.com. Oh, I'm looking at your ties, and yellow ties, black ties, I love ties. And I shop, all, and I, can, I should be able to shop all day over HTTP, and you should still track me with that session ID. And then as soon as I, log in to look at my account of my past Thai purchases, and I have the Thai purchase points, I might want to use, get one of your free ties. As soon as I log in, the, you should rotate the session, and that should then be a secure, an HTTP only session, locked to authentication only. And then in the end, you log out, you kill that session, generate a new session for HTTP. So I tend not to have mix, it's usually one or the other. And if you, if you do have a site that goes organically back and forth between HTTP and HTTPS, I think it's a design flaw. There are better ways to accomplish your goals. Fair answer? Yeah, I can imagine that you say, well, it's okay for instance to show your previous purchases from HTTP because they don't change anything sensitive. I say no way. That previous purchase is over, over an authenticated user account only. That should be over HTTPS, even with the basic e-commerce site. So I say, no, please don't show my private purchase history unless it's under authentication. And if you're over authentication, it needs to be um, HTTPS. Yeah, but that means any site that does some profiling and helping you to go to the site needs to run only on over HTTPS. No, only after I log in to look at my profile. Almost every e-commerce site does it just like that. Again, if you're, you're yeah, go ahead, Yo, I'm sorry. Is, is it worth having a discussion? I mean, why not just having everything over HTTPS? 
Yes. Yes. You say that uh, the performance hit is, is important, but Google measured this I, when they when they made the yeah. transition to HTTPS, and they noticed the performance hit of one percent. Because they cr they hacked the protocol. They modified their the the hand the SSL handshake, removed a few steps. They have hardware acceleration. They have the largest cloud on the planet, and they have more PhDs than they even know what to do with, with that kind of, and they, have, they haven't shared a lot of this information that's rolled through different sites. So, I mean, that, that's a, and I agree. If you do it really right, you and you shift to HTTPS, there's almost no performance change. But that's Google. That's not the real, that's not the real world for everyone else, I dare say. That's my counterpoint to that. Okay, so we need, we need to do these metrics for the vanilla site. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we, we, we need to discuss whether it's actually worth uh, it. And, and you know, it's all about context, too. If you're a cookie website <coughs> and you have cookie recipes, I, I, I'm not going to put a lot of security on it. And if, if you're really trying, if it's a, as soon as you enter the world of finance and e commerce, personal, personal information, privacy data, healthcare, you know, I agree. Maybe that whole site should be HTTPS. And I do see several US banks that are purely HTTPS. It is a compelling thing to consider, and maybe we will move in that direction. So that's a fair comment. Back to you, I'm sorry. I, I think also, apart from like, the handshake and the knowledge of itself, also caching is something that we need to consider as well. If you're only running over aggressive channels, you can't cache them immediately. And if you have, uh, for instance, the images are not protected by such a cookie, you can just uh, get them from static websites. If they're embedded, or you, or you get the mixed warning. Mm. This site is partially HTTPS and partially not HTTPS, which is an ugly message. And I think that's also a very important consideration. So while moving towards HTTPS only websites, that they might lose a couple of their model. Yeah, but now, but but keep in mind what Yo was saying. The work that Google has done to optimize SSL is some of the best we've seen. They're skipping parts of the handshake. They have hardware acceleration throughout the cloud, and they really are rolling out SS SSL in a way that almost does nothing to harm performance. It's almost negligible. And so I think that's possible as SSL technologies mature and roll throughout the rest of the industry. It's going to take quite a while, if ever. Yeah, but that's so uh, if I say, as a corporate uh, group, I, I want to actually have my bandwidth reduced, then if you don't have any caching, then you need to collect any data to the endpoint. So if you have images or even pages that can be cached, all static information, now you need to, to re request that to the server if you are using the channels. So what most, what most banks have done, I watched Wells <coughs> Fargo over time, they switched to all very low resolution images. They've gone, up, they've gone out of their way to like really choose what images they display carefully in as low a resolution way as possible. Go look at the Wayback Machine of key banks and you'll see this big change over the last 10 years. So. There's always ways to pull it off. Um, uh, this is very debatable. Let me, let me end this debate with this. When you, when you, here's the workflow for e-commerce. You, you hit the site over HTTP, you're assigned a session ID, and that's not an authentication session, that's a tracking session over HTTP is just fine. Then the moment that user logs in to, to complete an e-commerce work, to begin an e-commerce workflow, you invalidate that tracking cookie and rotate them to a new session ID to stop fixation that's then secure and HTTP only. And then if the user logs off, you invalidate the session, give them a new one that goes back to basic tracking. That's a standard e-commerce workflow to, to answer your question, to handle session identifiers over mixed environments. That's, that's the best I have for that right now. Cool. And so why should a session, here's a quiz question, not really, here's a knowledge question. What does the secure flag do in session cookies, or cookies in general? What does the secure flag do? Provide SSL. That's the negative rule. Give me the positive. You're you're right, beer drinker. Um, <laughs> what what is the uh, uh, what what is the positive rule for that? A secure flag on a cookie will. You're wrong. I'm just, just semantics. I'm sorry. Um, when you put a secure flag on a cookie, it will only be sent over an HTTPS connection. So if some attacker tr tricks you into redirecting to an insecure page on that site, the session cookie will not be sent over the wire. 
It's a very simple, good control. Most frameworks apply this automatically to their authentication layer. The second flag you want to add to a cookie is HTTP only. And this is like a, a little band-aid. It helps a little bit. I don't think it's that. I really don't think it's that important, frankly. But HTTP only says, I'm no longer going to let JavaScript access your cookies. So it stops one type of XSS, session, session theft. I think you should just stop XSS and not worry about HTTP only. But it's a good extra flag to use. There's never, a, there's never, I conject, there's never a need for JavaScript <coughs> to access the session ID. I have not had some, anyone tell me a good reason why in 10 years. Please prove me wrong. But I think HTTP only is a great control. Um, it's not necessary, but it, it works in this case. It will stop JavaScript from accessing your cookie data, which stops one kind of XSS, which is session theft. And again, it works. It works in all browsers. It's neat. But that should not be how you stop XSS. You should stop XSS through encoding and validation and content security policy and other controls. So oh, here, where, um, where are we here? Um, two minutes. Two minutes? All right, quick, so quick other password defenses. This is basic stuff. Um, I'm saying you do autocomplete in your form and input fields for passwords. This will encourage your browser not to store it in the autocomplete cache. Do you ever go to a website, start typing in your credit card, a site you've never been to before, and they show your credit card and let you just click and, and autofill it? That's because everything you type into a browser is saved in a text file that, that saves all of your typing traffic to do autocomplete for fields that look the same. Like if you start typing in address field one, by default, that's saved to an autocomplete text file. Then you go to a whole different site and type in your address, and they pre-fill it. You say autocomplete is off, it shuts that off in the browser, or encourages the browser to shut it off. GoBio, HTTP post, um, we know about do not display passwords in the browser. Input type is password, obscures the password field. So when you're typing in the password, you can't see it. Basic stuff, we should be using it. Um, I, I, this last one here is very debatable. The state of the art today is to use password hashing. That guy right there, right there, that's John Steven. Go see his talk on password storage. If you care about this, I'll be there. I'm, I'm interested in it. Um, I'm starting to disagree with my own advice here because of John. And it's very frustrating and I've been waiting for tomorrow for about six months. John, you tease. So, all right. <laughs> Moving on. Forgot password, good design. Go look at the forgot password cheat sheet at OWASP. Yes, yes, you? Can you uh, maybe just clear up uh, possible confusion? So, um, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it's during a threat modeling session that you will be talking about the secure password. <coughs> there are two sessions back to back tomorrow. Uh, the first is a threat modeling session, the second is a secure design session. Uh, both are going to be using password storage as their foil. Uh, mm -hmm. I talked about this in the keynote, the forgot password workflow. I encourage you to read the forgot password cheat sheet from OWASP, which talks about this. The, the nuts and bolts of this is we want to simulate multi-factor authentication during the forgot password workflow. Most every bank is doing this already. We, all, we know about encryption in transit. We have a great site from Qualys, my competitor, SSLlabs.com. It's a free assessment for public facing sites to see how good your SSL configuration is. Um, I've used that site for a lot of fun purposes in the past. Forgive me, John. And uh, we have the OWASP TLS um, protection cheat sheet. It's, like, it's a, a guide that assists uh, administrators to configure SSL properly. It's just a guide, it's not a complete answer, but it's a good discourse on how to configure TLS properly. Also consider things like certificate pinning, and other more advanced defenses if necessary. You basically <coughs> send your cert to, to Google, and they will embed that cert in the browser for free, and then pin any hit to that site to that specific cert and that cert only to help defeat man in the middle of other attacks and malicious CAs and so on. Um, I'm gonna skip this for now. We don't have time for this. There's the answer. Guess what, I'm done. Thank you so much for your time, folks, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day today. Take care, everyone.